Uh, well, thanks for the invite, um, guys. It's great to be back at Plymouth. And I got the brief that I could talk about anything, yeah. which is the first time anyone's asked me to do that. So if I'm, I might be taking the piss here. So I'm, I am going to talk about anything I fancy um, but, and bring it back to the student experience. So um, I, I studied illustration and it led to lots of other things. Um, and I used to teach part time um, here. Um, and I'm just going to show you lots of exciting things and hopefully they're going to make you think about your practice and, and stuff like that. But uh, I'm going with this general theme of uh, design. So another thing about what I do is I do a lot of books about street art and I've done books about sketching and we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, so we're going to talk about the creative process and this idea of desire lines. And this, this slide's in there for no other reason but that I just love these lines. Um, so my dad's Portuguese and he's obsessed with uh, Portuguese cobblestones. So that if you ever go to Portugal, they're, they're everywhere. And I just love the way that we're, 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 with this kind of form of art, we're kind of making lines and patterns. And, and for me, that's, that is kind of street art. And I love these, love these lines. So, uh, He's, he's, you might even find his Pinterest. He has got like something like 600 pictures of Portuguese <laughs> cobblestones. And it's also an amazing craft. Last time I was in Portugal, uh, just watching people just kind of doing, doing that by hand. And it's just a really cool thing. So not sure if it really relates, but I wanted to get that in there. But the, the real idea of design lines is this. Um, so has anyone heard the term of design lines, desire paths? So, uh, so it's this idea that really we, we try and um, design the environment, but people make their own decisions about where they want to go. So you can design a park or a street or a city, but people, if they want to go somewhere, they'll, they'll go and they'll make their own desire lines. So it's this, this, um, this is my sort of me metaphor for um, basically taking your creative path. So um, part of your creative path is all going to be I need to do this because this is going to pay the rent. Hopefully, at the same time, it's going to be something that's super creative and merge those together. At the same time, um, with your creative paths, you, you're always going to, there's something about art that's kind of therapeutic. So you're always going to be making some things for no other reason that you just want to make it. And you know, I'm, I'm you know, decades into my career and I still can't help myself just drawing things for the for the love of it. So this, it, it's how you take these paths and how, um, that I find interesting. Um, and then I'm also going to be talking about um, let's just doing things and shaping our society, because uh, that's a, a big theme in, in street art. Um, and let's talk about that a bit further. So over the years, I've made a lot of books. Um, and I've often questioned why have I ever spent 20 years making books? Why do I keep doing this? Uh, why do I do it? Uh, why do I want to do it? Um, but, so, but for me, I'm interested in these questions. What, why do we make art? Why did I get drawn to street art? And that's partly this idea of creative independence. That um, Street artists tend to be making things um, for, them, for themselves, like doodling and just kind of wanting to, to share and share their art, much as illustrators do. Um, I'm interested in techniques and, um, and certain topics. And o over the years, I start, the first book I worked on was um, Stunts of Graffiti, and it led to a few other graffiti books. Then I got obsessed with sketchbooks, and that led to another couple of books. And then I became more interested in materials um, and I wrote a book about using recycled materials and later on a book about scale. And then finally, just a book about everything and how it all inter interconnects. Um, so, um, but the overriding the th theme there is creative fr freedom. Um, what, what excites me about um, uh, street artists was this like independent thinking and uh, just to pick out one artist that I've continuing to like it's this artist called Blue and this is a, a kind of freeform um, 
drop, you know, dropping a bit of watercolour and then just seeing where that's going to go. And, and then the same thing applied at a massive scale. So it's that applying drawing, applying freeform ideas, that kind of thing really always excites me, that free association. And then um, I'm a kind of an older dad and I'm watching my kids grow up and drawing better than me, <laughs> bastards. Uh, but, there, but there's that unfettered creativity of ch childhood that, that I think comes out in this sort of free association, which I think we can always keep looking back to. Um, so I'm going, the reason I started writing a book, um, after graduating, I, I worked as a designer um, for many years and then I just started getting excited about stencil art because I, I was living in Bristol at the time. So um, I was really lucky to kind of live on a street where Banksy started to put up art in around 97. So that was the first stencil I saw of Banksy, this little rat. And, um, and ACC TV camera. And what I liked about this um, idea of, of just of a stencil is just you've just got one way of like merging ideas and just simplifying. So there's something I really liked about that aesthetic. And lots of things around Bristol influenced me to, to get interested in stencil art. Um, 3D from Massive Attack was also a graffiti artist and he started using stencils in this sort of rough way for his album covers and other Bristol artists. So um, that's my interest in stencils. But hey, we are in an illustration course, so let's think about stencils from an illustration um, point of view. So, um, so you may not be at all interested in street art or street stencils, but actually stencils are kind of at the root of illustration. Uh, certainly from commercial illustration uh, was made possible by stencils. So, has everyone, have you ever done Poshua um, workshops here? I think that we have done in the, in the past. This, um, this technique is basically a kind of handmade uh, precursor to screen printing. Um, in, before screen printing was invented, and if people wanted to, in addition, this, something like this beautiful Art Deco illustration, if they went to produce masses of those, they um, would have to use Poshua technique. Uh, and in, in the heyday of the pochoir technique, there were big studios, apparently there were around 13 studios in Paris, uh, you know, full of people doing this process of, of layering. And now um, I find this quite interesting, uh, this idea of layering, because this is what illustrators are doing all the time. If, if you're using Procreate, Photoshop, you're, you're, you're layering, you're basically layering, you're making layered images, and that's what um, uh, Poshua is. Um, and uh, some of this all looks quite contemporary, um, but it's all from the sort of 1930s. Uh, and all, all of this, so you, had a rough, you would have a rough um, stencil template, but within that, the people, people would be using um, watercolors and, and using brush marks, but being able to reproduce these things hundreds and hundreds of times. So and it was quite influenced by Japanese printmaking. So that's a, but you can go and delve in to have a look a bit more about Poshua. We're rushing ahead. Um, and what was also interesting is in those days of before reproductions, if you wanted to, you either bought a painting by Matisse or, or, or Picasso, um, but the same, um, a lot of artists began to use Poshua as to, to create limited editions b before screen printing. So this is um, a box, an image from a box of Miro prints all using the Poshua technique. And what it allowed artists to do is to, to brush, spray, spatter and sponge, but in multiple editions. Uh, and probably one of the most famous pieces of Poshua was Matisse's Jazz. Again, this is like um, an edition of 20. Uh, um, as you'll know, he, he was famous for cutting, making these images with cut maquettes. Um, but to reproduce this book, it was used use Poshua techniques. 
And this, he made this hold up in his studio um, when the Nazis took over Paris. So it was one good thing that came out, came out of that. Um, so this is the new book that I'm working on, that I'm going to do a bit of a preview on. And first of all, the book cover is hilarious to me because it makes me look like I'm a, so, some sort of hooded dude, like, <laughs> going, hey, that's Tristan Mankos, it's a graffiti book. But uh, yeah, that's not me, but uh, these are my friends. So. Um, what I wanted to do is return to stencils after 20 years, because a lot of things had happened um, to that technique, and I'd met a lot of people around the way. Uh, tra since the first book, I got to travel to places like Mexico, Colombia, and meet, and meet people. And I was really interested in actually sh showing people how this was done. Uh, so this book isn't out yet, but um, I, my art director um, Instagrammed this cover. So it's going to have a, um, a kind of a cardboard cover um, and then a, a soft cover sheet. Um, but basically, we're just, we're just encouraging people to, to look at stencil art and show them how it's done. And for me, for me it's the art of action. Um, as an art student, I used to do a stencil pretty much every night with my friend. It was such a, such a fun thing to do because you just get a photo and just start tracing around it. This is before showing Photoshop and then cut it out and then sneak off to the back of Tesco's <laughs> and it's like, yeah, there's another one. And, and it was just something very instant. So I, I've always loved it um, and I keep coming back to it. So that's that, you know, why do, why do we keep coming back to things? Well, I've, I've come back to it for one final time one of the things I like about it is, is, this, is this sort of authenticity and credibility. So we, we saw this um, earlier on, the 1920s Poshwa technique. It is a fine art technique. But later on, in the 70s, 60s, it became some, something a bit more raw, this idea of stenciling. And this is a super famous image, Susan Mattella's model of man. Um, and it uh, was taken in the Sandinista um, uprisings and it became adopted uh, as an image as a as a stenciled image for you know a sign of revolution um, and from this um, it's something that 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 banks are then co-opted so artists now kind of co-opt this idea of, of protest and like play around with it so obviously he's played around with that same same idea but uh, you know, put a little visual pun there with uh, the flowers. And so instead of the, the Coca-Cola Molotov bottle, um, he did a Tesco value petrol bomb. I don't know if you remember this, but this was, this was to protest. On, in Stokescroft and Bristol, they were protesting that they, they were shockingly going to open a Tesco metro. And it's like, we never, we will never stand for this in Stokescroft. <laughs> Up oh, yours, and there were, there were riots, and we burnt cars, and and, and at the same time, uh, Banksy made this uh, Tesco petrol bomb available to 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 uh, with funds going to the anarchist book fair. But it, it, it all goes back to to that, um, you know, where it's all come from from the 60s. Um, and then this this made me think about okay. Um, this, when I was writing this book, I was thinking about the aesthetics of anger. So, you know, here, here's yet another sort of quite crude stencil on the, on the, on the left. It, it's like fists and like stop this. And, but it's, it's kind of a bit crude. But in the same city in Colombia, there's a, a, a female artist called Air um, who's, who's using stencils but with giant murals. But so this one's kind of more more aesthetic and it's using kind of poppy colors a bit like uh, a bay um but so it, it's trying to get that balance of like uh, you know yes we are angry but at the same time um how can we use our art more aesthetically so that's something i've been trying to explore and that that's coming up now with uh, extension rebellion which is this you know this fantastic symbol that you could get a robot to paint for you, or, or, or you, can crudely, crudely, you, can, you can crudely do that symbol and people will know what you mean. But at the same time, uh, there's a whole sort of graphic design uh, package 
that you can, that's been designed for Extinction Rebellion. Um, and you can kind of download it and then and use it yourself and make stencils and it's all based on colors. So, um, and, it's, and it's giving us that um, recognizability, but it, it's, I'm just trying to look, put the two things together. Do, is it better to, that some things designed or some things crude? I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm kind of interested in both of those things. And I, I, and I love this uh, extensive brilliant uh, design. Um, so in the book, um, I'll try and speed up because I'm trying to change too much. I show people how to make stencils with the basics, and I've had help from artists who generally show the process. So it's all about layering. Uh, but what's exciting for me, what's changing in stencil graffiti is one, it's going massive. Uh, this is an in, insane stencil, all hand cut. These are two guys in Mexico. The, you know, he's sleeping on the job. It's like this is a lot of work to do. Massive, massive stencils. Uh, they get, you know, it's getting really quite, kind of impressive. Um, they, before stencils were, you know, around this big, and now they're being used to do whole murals. So this, these are the two same. Um, Mexican guys rolling down the, their sheets and uh, uh, putting that into place. And then that's the final mural uh, added with color. And then this, this kind of leads on to this idea of, of placement, which, which, makes, which I find interesting about street art is it only really works outside and it only works in, in, this, in this place. So you, you can never quite convey this on a, in a flat area, so it's using that that street corner. Um, again, on the unimpressive front, you've got, there are, I can't show you the whole book, it's about 300 pages, but I'm trying to pick a few pages that were interesting. I love these artists called Monkey Bird. Uh, they're influenced by like Victorian illustrations and engraving, and they call themselves kind of uh, muralist print printmakers. So they make small scale prints, small scale engravings, and they literally just blow them up. And you get, and they make the most out of the um, the matrix that sen sensors produce. So they they're interested in in in, in the breaks and uh, basically giving you that kind of stained glass effect. And the monkey bird idea is this idea of um, uh, uh, celebrating nature and, and, and the animal kingdom. Uh, a few more examples of just like. Uh, illusion, optical illusions, um, what, what's kind of been made possible today by artists playing around with shadows and then and scale. So this is this is tiny. It's like this big. <laughs> so, it, you know, and uh, this artist called Jean from Belgium, he he used to work as a street cleaner and he was quite in, quite interested in how invisible they are, you know. They're kind of like you just everyone just ignores them, uh, and so he's kind of made them the heroes and in his work. Um, so in the book, I I've been really lucky to work with um, these Colombian guys who had already made half a zine about doing a stencil. So it's like brilliant. That's just what I need for this book. So we commissioned them to to do more pages and translated it from Spanish into English. And again, I can't show you everything, but it, it is kind of hilarious. So um, they, he first teaches you how to do the ABC uh, and how to kind of spray it and cut it. Cut it. And then uh, after a while, he sprayed ABC all around his room. And then what next? And then what next is Janet? <laughs> Janet. What? <laughs> Janet. Yes, what, girls, girls, really? So he, he decides his next sensor after ABC is going to be a girl. So he goes and gets a picture, image of a girl that he likes and does, it just shows you the Photoshop trickery that you go through to get to this, which we'll, we'll all be fam familiar with. So yes, it's, it, today we can use Photoshop to help us along with, with layering and, and stuff like that. At the same time, um, too much, I think too much technical layering it, it gets a bit boring. I'm, I'm quite interested in more like hand handcraft and hand techniques. But this is just for beginners getting to this idea of like 
how do you how do I get this image onto a wall? It just shows that. And again, um, a few more pages from the book, just showing you simply how you could just register your stencil with uh, clear acetate and how you go about registering something you'd all be familiar with, really, with screen printing, just like putting a little X and then building up layers. Um, so the, one of my reasons for doing this book is, you know, if you're not angry, you're not listening. I mean, we are in a... And I, I was pleased to walk into Plymouth College and see creativity and social justice because this is what I'm presenting now, really. I think, you know, I think we're all sold on that idea that we've got to use our creativity to address issues. Um, so in the book, we're talking about protests and how that... Um, what I quite like about stencils is, is, is you can be like... I think I've even tried to teach primary kids to do it. But you could go from primary school to to 80. It's something that it's it's a workshop. If you're if you I mean a lot of artists use workshopping in their practice. It's something that you can just it's like an entry level into art, and then just by doing you start to think about more about art. So this is um, these are some workshops in Argentina, and this idea of mujer bonita es es la que lucha. So uh, a pretty woman is one who fights. So it's like, come on, let's fight. Uh, fight the fight. Um, and then these are some more um, campaigns from different artists. This is an artist in, in New York who seems to have the balls to do stencils on the, on the ground and get around um, town and, you know, do these campaigns all around the city. So he has sort of vegan campaigns anti-fur adopting animals and it's just um, you know i think it's a, a great medium for for that um so okay so why look at stencils again it, it feels like a tire perhaps a tire pocket for, for me it seemed to be rent generated by other new things so big murals i think it's exciting this other side of things that i think is exciting is these mass paste-ups so these are big pace ups that are going on in uh, Argentina and Brazil. And as you can see, it's not all stencils. There might be a one stencil here, some type of, you know, a wood type poster, somebody hand painting stuff. It's just bringing whatever you want to, to the game. And it's that whole dear idea of a, a network of people. Um, people, I forgot I'm on camera. So if I had said any rude words. <laughs> Or <laughs> just scrub that a little bit out. Um, anyway, um, but what I like about this community is is people are supporting each other, posting things to each other's cities. So you like they might not be able to get their works seen in the city. So you you just send a tube and get a big paste up going. Um, the other thing that I like about since so this this idea of um, a palimpsest. So palimpsest is a very old word, which in the olden days when paper was really rare, uh, people would, um, or they would write and then they would scrub it out and write it on again and you get layers and layers and layers. So it's this idea of that street art is a palimpsest. It's, it's layering and layering and layering on textures. Uh, and this kind of thing start, uh, what stencils really took off in um, Argentina in the 90s, um, during an economic crisis, and people started to just post up it and then layer and layer in, in little areas, not knowing who they were, and eventually they kind of found each other as artists, and now they kind of work together. But, this, but creating with different kind of um, icons and objects, they started to form um, groups. So this is the work of a, a number of groups in, in Argentina. And uh, it gives that effect of like sort of Rauschenberg, pop art, just layering, layering, and kind of screen printing effects. There's another big paste up. Um, so, um, again, this is Argentina. I, lo I love this rough and ready look. And I want to talk about this guy, Rusty Demos. So, Rusty Demos um, kept finding like bits of cardboard on the street, and he's kind of started to deconstruct them and uh, turn them into kind of robot shapes. 
and then reintroduce them as kind of multiple robots. So I like that idea that he's recycling things that he's finding on the streets and putting them back. Uh, this was the guy that was in the room um, that I wanted to talk about. Um, he is interested in um, wood type and he produces lots of posters in old fashioned wood type printing places in Argentina, but at the same time he, he's been doing these big blow ups of these this, these posters. And he's a bit of a dude. He's got quite a cool, yeah, you want to try that. Um, and what, what we've wrote about in the room is these, these messages and how they work. Um, so this, is, um, this message says, it's strictly forbidden to be lukewarm. So it, it's, that, it's playing with that idea of like, um, uh, like public messaging. I uh, hope I won't run over it too much. Oh, I've only got a few more slides. Um, another thing we talk about in the book is using tone. Again, something that you might be familiar with. Just, um, just again, te teaching people how to create weird tone effects and hand cutting them. So this is an, this is an artist uh, playing around with tone to make images. And this is another artist using tone to make CMYK printing, so full sensors to create a full kind of thing. So all, all of this stuff is kind of um, wasn't around when we were first looking at stencils 20 years ago. So it's technically coming on. And uh, I think this is quite an interesting approach as well, just how people are interpreting lines and shapes and patterns. So this is an artist who kind of has developed this cross-hatching technique and then started to use that in his um, stencil of images. I think it's really beautiful. Um, other artists that I've met in Mexico, um, again, they're, they're looking back to the old days of um, paper cuts and pochoir and old-fashioned old techniques, but bringing, bringing it into the gallery on the streets. Um, again, this is a Italian female artist, um, Alice Pasquini, um, and she just she kind of start, starts with a stencil, but then she just, uh, just kind of draws on it with Poscas and other pens, and it's uh, this idea of mixed media, but just kind of using the found textures, found textures on paper, found textures on walls. Um, so I tried to give as many tips from artists as I could find. Uh, so this is an artist called Daniel Mellim, and he kind of he kind of embraces this what he calls graphic errorism. He he likes mess. So what he'll do is to create this messy effect. Is he'll get a stencil if it's all messy with spray paint, he'll just dab it around, and you'll start to get these dabs, or you'll turn it over, and, and gradually. Uh, in, in his paintings, all the mess is kind of what he's after. R rather than trying to get a pristine sense of I've done it, he's like um, waiting for mess to happen in, the, in his paintings. Um, and then another secret technique that I found out from another artist is I found out that he wasn't a stencil artist at all. So what he does is he does paper cuts, so these little tiny paper cuts. And then he, um, he projects them on a wall like that with a, with a projector and then just makes a massive mural so that there aren't any gaps in, in the work. And he told me that this, he was saving paper. <laughs> Forget the stencil, just, just get the line. So I thought that was kind of an interesting way that it moved back to, to paper. And then uh, another technique that I thought was interesting was this sort of 3D stencil. An artist in England called Elis, and he's sort of he's very meticulous, and he's sort of built up this um, this image through lots of layers, and he's really interested in in just the tiny, tiny flicky spray that you can get. And anyway, I just don't know quite how he does it, but he has a lot of patience. Um, but um, but that's what he's art. Different artists are attracted to different parts of this technique, and I think it's this. These last ones are all about sort of tacti tactility. Um, and again, I'm just throwing in another slide to just show how things are 
getting experimental. So this is uh, on the on the left is a stencil artist who who started to use vinyl to create kind of like global earth art, I guess drone art you could call it. So the, these are kind of movable pieces, so he can drag them around, take a photo as though it was in a video game or something like that. And then the same artist, um, this is just how he plans up a, a massive mural and his approach is a little bit like Lego. So he has lots and lots of little pieces that he knows he can use to build up a build up an architectural um, piece. So again, again, I can't. It's mind-bogglingly billions of hours involved in the work. Uh, and then this this is just to. You saw earlier a kind of youth workshop. This is like work, this is working with um, pensioners, like eight-year-olds. Um, so this is a project in Russia where they were, they decided to chat to their old age pensioners and say, "Do you want to have a go at graffiti?" And they're like, "Yeah." <laughs> so so just getting them involved in that conversation and just um, and again, I think it's accessibility that I like about it. Um, the other, another project that made me think about doing this book was um, uh, Banksy had set up a, it was now closed due to COVID, but uh, it's Pex, um, set up this hotel in Palestine so people could go and, go and judge themselves uh, what the situation was. And he's encour he, encour he set up this shop to encourage people to do their own stencils um, while they're visiting so they can they can leaf through this browser and like, get some ideas. <laughs> and uh, no, I, basically, I, I worked on that browser and I worked on the, um, the posters. So I had, it was kind of, they made me think, ah, oh, I need to do another book about <laughs> stencils. Um, so how do we achieve collective change? How are we going to, um, uh, uh, you know, it, it, I'm looking at then and now in this one. I guess uh, you'd have had uh, talks about the Paris 1968 Atelier Populaire. This was basically um, art students uprising in the 60s, and they used posters, they used stencils, and they basically used their art to, to kind of protest the situation in the 60s. Same thing happening now, if, if any of you had tickets to Glastonbury. Uh, most years they invite Shangri-La Art, who, who kind of um, encourage artists to come along and, and shout about stuff. Um, so so the, th the three things that keep me boringly going back to street art are, after 20 years, if the things that bring me back to it is the creativity, communication, and community. So. I, f I feel like this is what drives me back to this topic. And I, I think it's, it's, it's a combination of those things. If it's not creative, it's not interesting to me. If it's not communicating something, I'm not bothered. Uh, and, if it, and if it's not really thinking about the people that are walking, uh, who are living there, um, then I, I think it's a missed opportunity. So this is a project on, on the wall between Mexico and America. Uh, and uh, this artist, JR, has set up this table that kind of works in between the, t the two communities. And it's, this, it, it's a symbolic gesture, basically, to, to kind of um, create this event and use art as part of it. I'm running a tiny bit over, but I'm near, I think I'm done. I'm done. So um, these are the, the desire light. If there was a theme to this talk, I think this is, <laughs> I'm trying to wrap it up. Uh, so this is another piece by Tanu Ron, Improvise, all directions are correct. So, um, you know, stencils might be just one technique, other, other craft techniques I think are interesting. And I think from a point of view of the world of illustration, it's becoming very digitized. Um, all those kind of layering, it, it, it's, it's very easy to forget that you can actually just go and make a piece of art with, with a brush or the, you know, some of the craft techniques. Um, and then you, you've got something to show for it. You haven't just got 
a picture that scrolls away for <laughs> the next day. Um, so, um, I mean, the, hopefully there's something in that talk that made you think about craft and marks. Um, and then there's just this creative freedom that, that a lot of these artists are showing. You know, there's no specific brief, but at the same time, a lot of these artists have carved out a creative career from, from, the, from the process. Um, and that, that whole hashtag, something to say, using art for change, I think is basically what, what inspired me to do the book. And hopefully giving away all the techniques of these artists, just off you go. Maybe you want to do a sense, or maybe you don't. But it's just kind of, I'd, hopefully it's that idea, some of those ideas of like creating collective, collectively. Um, and then, you know, even though we're talking about age-old technique of stenciling, people keep finding other ways of like playing around with it. So it's like uh, even the basic techniques, there's room for new innov innovations. So people are working at different scales or different patterns or uh, etc. Um, so yeah, you've seen the book before everybody else, and that's it. The end. <laughs> Oh, you're welcome.